There's no trouble. She finished them all. Rapid quick. Okay. I'll be back about three minutes. Yes. I just have trouble. I don't know where to start. Like which. Sometimes I don't know to convert it or to move everything over. Um, well, you you get to you learn how to do the problems by experience. Yeah. That doesn't help you in the beginning. Yes. <laughs> so the beginning, it's bootstrap. It's very hard to do. Yeah. But after you do a few of them, uh, then they become easier. So they're hardest, the first few are the very much hardest ones. And you work with, with examples as much as you can on those. Mm -hmm. 27 is the same as 21? Oh, yeah. But you know, I'm the one that was 24. Uh-huh. Yeah, get spun to us again. Okay. And where were those, I, I want to get a, a drink, but where were those identities where it was? Because I might be misreading them, and so that's why. I need to get a copy of that. Okay. Yeah. Just this is my package for everything. Yeah. Some are in ten point four. The main ones that we're using are on the next. Get out of your way. Do you understand all that? Some of it, like some of it, I just. Hit dead ends a lot. All the ones with stars. Uh, I don't know where to go from here. But you have the first time. Yeah. And the rest of all confusing. Yeah, like. Let's see. Yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. And I just, yeah, I just kept, like, not knowing where to go. I stopped it. <laughs> I was just yeah. like, no. I'm not going anywhere with any of this. Yeah. I kept looking. At the answers for reference, mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't get the answer. The only one I could get the answer to was on the front. So, uh, is this the identity? I, I'm just going to Yeah, like. It's the same as um, two I mean, the first one is the easiest right here. Mm -hmm. This one. Really? I don't think it's that one. Mine you just. So, you just. Right. Just that was just you, right? Okay. But didn't you see the answer? Has it okay. Answer? I, all right. Oh, six? No. Uh, mine have been three, and then that was the same. Um, I, I didn't even check the other. I should do that. I just do it to make sure I'm getting all the answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was like having trouble with, I might have gotten like one or the answers or something. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't even get to this part. <laughs> I think I was doing the whole year. I eat when I get nervous or stressed. Get the 
right hand. I don't know if I'm using the wrong formula or whatever. Well, then let's just do that one together when we come to them. Because yeah. the best way to do these is just what you looked at, do examples, follow the examples in class. Mm -hmm. Because just a few pictures and a few equations and all of those words just are confusing. Yeah, I know. I was like rereading those sentences. <laughs> no, I, got, I get lost. Because to try to explain mathematical uh, calculations and equations is a, an impossible task. And if you do do it, you're the only one that can follow it. Yeah, that's true. I think you'd have to write that out. Yes, it makes sense, sense to you, but no one else cannot. Yeah, I've tried. Yeah. There's a lot more answers. Yeah, I know. I was thinking there's maybe like two. <laughs> and I, looked, yeah. I scrolled down. I was like, there's like four. <laughs> Oh, dang, I was like, I didn't know. Oh, wait, you know what? Maybe there's four because maybe there's two that doesn't want to do that. Did you, did you remember to divide K? Yes. By, yeah. You have to divide K also when you're dividing. That's sometimes an error. What's the equation that you're working with there, the first equation? Oh, well, we're just going over number yeah. nine. Like, number I've nine. got the first two parts, like the x equals 3 pi over 4 plus 6 pi K, and the x equals 9 pi over 4 plus 6 pi K. And then it says, that's the, it says that or that, and then x equals 3 pi over 4. Because so they want you to restrict it to 0 to 2 pi. That's all. So the only ones that will work are k equals 0. Because as soon as k equals 1, you're outside of 0 to 2 pi. Okay, that's what so they need a subset for the answer. Because they did say 0 to 2 pi. So mm -hmm. I thought we didn't have to use the... Two pi k. You have to use a 2 pi k so because if the angle is very tiny, because you get to divide the k also into little pieces. Okay. Um, let me do one that illustrates that if that's suitable for you. Oh, yes, please, because I didn't know Okay. Um, now, I forget what number this one might be, but it's cosine of 3x equals 0. So, does anyone remember the problem number? It's even 1 or something? Okay, I'll just do it as an example. Okay. So this is an example. So we make our usual substitution, yeah. u equals 3x. And we get cosine of u equals 0, which means that u is equal to pi over 2, but u is also equal to 3 pi over 2, also equal to 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, so we have to keep going upwards by k pi. So this is the full family of solutions See, for zero. Yeah, that makes sense. But I, I thought because you were zero to two pi, so to me that's like in one revolution. Well, what I did was I made a shortcut here. First, u equals pi over two plus two pi k. U also equals three pi over two plus two pi k if you want to break them out. But 3 pi over 2 is pi over 2 plus a k, so you can combine them if you want to. Or you can keep them separately if you want to. It does not matter. And so... Next step is to back substitute. U has nothing to do with the answer. So the answer is 3x equals pi over 2 plus k pi. Now we have to divide everything by 3. Okay. And um, this produces x pi over 18. Oh, this is that sort of nasty one. So this produces um, x is equal to pi over 18 plus k over 3, pi. And this is why you had to keep the k, because now it gets divided by 3. Is not pi over 2 the, uh, the... Well, let's do it on the side. No. Pi over 6 divided by 3 over 1 equals pi over 6 divided by 3 over 1 equals pi over 6 times 1 third. And I win this one. No, no, sorry. I mean, the pi over 6 should be 
Um, Cause, 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 it was, cause I copied it wrong. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what it said. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought this was an unusual number. <laughs> there is a miscopying there. And, uh, so, it, see. Oh, after dividing it. Well, after dividing it. But since I miscopied it, then I'm going to remove all of the miscopying. Okay. So this is a pi over 2. So this is pi over 2 plus k pi all divided by 3. And so rolling down, we get, as you were trying to tell me, x equals pi over 6 yeah. plus k over 3 pi, where k goes from 0 to infinity, agree? So the answers are x equals pi over 3 pi over 3 plus pi over 3, um, pi over 3 plus 2 pi over 3, and all the way on up until we, until we're out over exceeding 2 pi. So this is just um, pi, um, pi over 3. This is 2 pi over 3, agree? Now we add these together, uh, we're going to get um, 4, 6, and 2, 6. This is going to be a pi. Okay. So let's continue developing the answers by having more numbers of k. Okay? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, why did you add pi over 3 to pi over 3? Um, because I let k equals 1. K equals 1. Pi over 6. Hi, you're still doing this. Wow. I'm still doing typos. Okay. Apologize. No, wait. I think, I think that's okay. Sufficient to stop? No, no, no. I mean, where? No. Okay. Now, so K equals 0. X equals pi over 6. K equals 1. X equals pi over 6 plus pi over 3. K equals 2. X equals pi over 6 plus 2 pi over 3. Oh, okay. So you get a whole family of answers. That's why you have to keep K in some of these problems. So k equals 3, x equals pi over 6 plus pi. k equals 4, x equals pi over 6 plus uh, 4 pi over 3. And we keep going until we exceed 2 pi. So let's simplify some of these answers. Um, K equals 2 pi over 6 plus pi over 3 is 1 6 plus 2 6. This is pi over 2. Okay. Um, it's strange. Okay, but it's true. Okay, so pi over 6 plus is um, 5 pi over 6. The next one is 7 pi over 6, agree? So everyone, um, that one's suspicious. Um, yeah, no, that's um, pi over 3 is 2 pi over 6. So plus 1 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, okay, that works. So now, here we have um, 7 pi over 6, pi over 6 um, plus um, 8 is 9 pi over 6 equals 3 pi over 2. Simplified down. And now we'll continue with our family of answers. And so we have k equals 5. Plus 5 pi over 3. 
And that's 10, that's 11 pi over 6. And then k equals 6, x equals pi over 6 plus uh, 2 pi, um, 6 pi over 3 plus 2 pi, and that's 2 pi. So we have to stop. So we found our family of answers. And, sorry, can yeah. I get the K equals 1, K equals 2, K Adding, equals 3. Okay. Uh, With the first um, the number, K equals 0. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. K equals 0. And the things you're adding to it are oh. multiples of pi over 2? Oh, I just substitute in this formula. I don't. Oh. So I let K equals 1, <coughs> and I get pi over 3. Oh, I see. I let K equals 2, I get 2 pi over 3. Okay. So it's just substitution. I'm still not yet figuring out why you just did k times pi instead of 2 pi over 3. Oh, because I wanted to have make my work reduced by 2. If I didn't do that, then you would have to do this one separately, just as we did, and then this one separately, just as we did. And how do you know which one to choose? Which is it both true? I mean, oh, so you can do it with either one. Yes, both. You have to do both. You can't ignore either one of them. These are both solutions. Because the solutions for u, cosine of u equals zero, what are the angles that have a zero for cosine? Yeah, pi over two and three pi. That's right. So this equation has two, two basic solutions mm -hmm. for u, okay. but many more solutions for x. But for this u equation u equals pi over two plus three pi? Yeah. Would it matter if I chose pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2? You have to, um, you either choose pi over 2 plus 2 pi k and 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi k, yeah. but these will combine into pi over 2 plus 1 pi k. Okay. I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, um, say you had, I guess how did you know to use two, pi over 2 instead of 3 pi over 2 in the combined Oh, in the combined ones, yes. um, because um, um, because pi over two is the first instance okay, so of the zero cosine. Okay, so it's the first instance, instance of it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. So let's review the zero cosines. The first zero cosine is here, isn't it? Pi yes. over two. Uh -huh. The next one is here, isn't it? Yes. Three pi over two. And the next one is up here, uh, which is 5 pi over 2. And then the next one is down here. So you can handle this family by themselves and this family by themselves for your combined answer. Or you can just realize that you can uh, describe both of these by 1 k, just by combining. So if we take, because all of and most of the ones that I did, there was two answers? That's right, because most of them won't combine. So you have to keep the answers separate. So how do I, I don't understand how do you, I know that that combines. You don't. Uh, you never combine them. Always work with two answers. You'll always get the same results. Oh, okay. So, so don't do this. You don't do that unless it's clear to you why that is easier. There's no need to do that. Just work with two answers and you'll always get the same set of results. Okay, so with working with two answers, mm -hmm. can we work with them? Can like, we get some answers out? Yes, can we work it out um, using the method of using the two answers? Oh yes, we certainly can. Because this method is using the one answer, and I'm worried about doing that. So okay, um, yes. Um, now, these are our sets of solutions, agree? Yeah. So let's do it with two answers, and see if we get the same sets of solutions. Yes. So one of the answers is that um, uh, u or x, uh, okay, there's another typo here. This means x, of course, agree? Yes. I hope nobody 
Six, there I go again. <laughs> You're just ahead of yourself. No, I'm, I'm stubborn. <laughs> six equals pi over six. And the second, um, uh, two pi and k over three, right? It should be pi over two. Um, Oh yeah, so you're right. I'm with you, so I have to do some better. Um, I have to do some better. Um, I have to do some more algebra first. These are my two families for you. Okay, so let's backtrack. All we have is this equation right here: cosine of u equals zero. Cosine of u equals zero. Okay, this tells you that u equals pi over two plus two pi k or u equals 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. We okay on that? Mm -hmm. So this means 3x equals pi over 2 yes. plus 2 pi k. That's what I was doing. 3x equals pi over 2. <laughs> You're right. Slow down. 3x equals pi over 2. Okay. And this means 3x equals 3 pi over 2 uh, plus 2 pi k. Okay, are we okay? I think so. Well, let's be sure. <laughs> let's be sure. Cosine of u equals 0. So what angles have 0 for a cosine? Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So I use both of them. But to get all solutions for each one, we have to add an arbitrary number of 2 pi's. So we have to add 2 pi k to each one. And does the, the 3x? I back substituted. Because the u was my own definition. So the original was cosine of u. OK. The u was my own substitution to make life more clear. So now I have to back substitute. Now, if I divide both sides of these equations by 3, then I'm going to get x equals pi over 6 plus k over 3, 2 pi. And here I'm going to get x equals 3 pi over 6 plus k over 3, 2 pi. Okay. Now, I'm going to put in a table. First, I'm going to let k equal 0. Then, what x do I get here? Pi over 6. Good. Now, I'm going to let k equal 0 here, and what x do I get? Which is pi over 2. Agreed? Okay. Now, notice that these were the first two answers that we got in the combined mode. Now I'm going to let k equals 1. And we get x equals pi over 6 plus uh, 2 pi over 3. Agree? 2 thirds pi. So let's add those together, and I think we're going to get 5 pi over 6. Is that true? Good. Now, let's let k equal 1 over here. We get x equals um, this is pi over 2, it hasn't changed, plus uh, 2 plus 2 pi over 3. Okay. So now let's combine those two together. Okay. So combine those two together. 7 pi over 6. Okay, good. So now let's let k equal 2. What do we get over here? Um, remember the J 
general formula is here. So k equals 2. So we're going to get um, x equals pi over 6 plus 4 pi over 3. Okay. And what does that combine to? Uh, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6, or 3 halves pi. Now I'm going to let you do this one over here for me. I want k equals 2, and I want you to evaluate this for k equals 2. Okay. Now let's come back to this one. We want k equals 3. And if we put in a k equals 3 into this equation, we're going to get pi over 6 plus 2 pi, too big. If we put a k equals 2 in this equation, we're going to get um, 3 pi over 2 plus 4 pi. Um, we're going to get, we put the k equals 3 in this equation, then we get pi over 2 plus 2 pi. So we have exhausted our range. These are our answers. First answer, pi over 6. Second answer, pi over 2. As you see, we alternate from family to family. Next answer, pi over, 5 pi over 6. Fourth answer, 7 pi over 6. Next answer, 3 pi over 2. And final answer, 11 pi over 6. So we did it in two, two families. In two separate families, as you requested. This is the way that we did it. So you do not have to go to one family. You can stay in two families. Absolutely. You'll get the same answers. So let's confirm that we got the same answers. Uh, take a look at these answers, pi over 6, and see how they compare with what we got over there. Pi over 6, pi over 2, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 3 pi over 2, 11 pi over 6, stop. So um, you do not have to use the shortcut. You can stay in two separate families, as you do for some of the other problems. It's not, that, it's not actually that often that you get to use the A uh, very good example that we have did. Okay, what I'd like to do now is um, put what this type of problem is on hold for a few moments. Uh, we'll come back to it later this class. But what I'd like to do now is to assure that we cover some new material today. So I'm going to distribute to you tonight's assignment. back side of this paper, in case you want to locate it. And as you see, it's called A8, and it's dealing with section 11.1. .1. So I'd like to congratulate you, because it means that you have now completely finished chapter 10. And chapter 10 was basic trigonometry. <laughs> so you've got the foundation now. What we're going to do now is apply what you learned in chapter 10. We'll do some applications. And that's what chapter 11 is all about. Okay. So don't take my word for it. It's called chapter 11, Applications of Trigonometry. It's a few pages <laughs> on two sides. But this guy does write a lot of words. All those words aren't really necessary. So I'm going to take you through tonight's section, which is 11.1. .1. So it would help if you could locate it in your, um, in your you don't have 11 printed yet? OK, well, we'll try to uh, work with that. You actually don't need it, because everything I want to have understood is going to be on the board anyway. But. Um, um, it's, it touches on the same material on these pages. So I'm dealing with the topics that he chose. 
just presenting them, I don't think, in a clear way. And it's not his fault, because he has to do it in a printed page. In a classroom, I imagine he would be absolutely lucid. It's really difficult to present stuff on a printed page. So let's proceed. And um, I'm going to draw a curve on the board. I'm going to ask you if you can tell me what curve I have drawn on the board. Sine wave. That's basic trigonometry. So if this is the angle theta, then this is the curve of sine of theta. Now, this angle here is pi. This angle here is pi over 2. So the sine curve peaks at pi over 2, and it peaks at a value of 1. Now, you know that the cosine of theta is equal to the sine of theta plus pi over 2. That's an identity. So if I want to draw the cosine curve, then it's going to be the sine curve, only instead of starting at 0, it's going to start at pi over 2. So this is where it's going to start because it's advanced by pi over 2. So instead of starting here, the cosine curve is going to start there. So it is a sine curve, but it just starts in a different place. So this is the function cosine theta. Now up till now, we've only been dealing with sine functions for simplicity. But now that we get into applications, we will use these two um, curves equally. So you should understand that this is what a sine function looks like, and you should understand that this is what a cosine function looks like. They're the same curve, but one starts at 0, and one starts at 1. And as we get into tonight's topic, we will use both the sine function and we will use both the cosine function. So be clear that the cosine function starts at 1, the sine function starts at 0. Now I want to um, revisit circular motion. So let's take some elementary concepts. center right here and say it's got a starting point which would be right here. Now if I'm going to run around the circle then there's a relationship between the number of times I can run around the circle in one second and how long it takes me to run around the circle once. So I'll give you an illustration. If I can run around this building if I can run around this building in one minute, well, let's say it this way. If I can run around this building three times in a minute, if I can run around this building three times in a minute, how long does it take me to run around once? A third of a minute, to be. So if I can run around three times in a minute, that's my frequency, and it's one over the period of doing it once, agree? So if I can run around this circle, um, in 20 minutes, how many times can I do it in an hour? If I can run around this circle once in 20 minutes, then how many times can I run around it in an hour? Three times. So the frequency is three times per hour, agreed? Or three times a second, or three times a minute. And the period is the amount of time it takes you to do that once. So period is a measure of time, agree? However, as I go around the circle, at any particular point that I have arrived at in some small time t, 
I will have traced out a central angle theta as I go around the circle. So this angle is growing as time goes by. So because the angle is growing, the angle has a velocity. And we call that the angular velocity. It's the rate of growth of the angle. So the angular velocity is the amount of angle divided by the time it took to create that angle. So the angular velocity is the amount of angle divided by the time it took to create that angle. Now, I can find a simple expression for omega if I consider one whole trip around. If I go around the circle one time, how long did it take me to go around the circle one time? Capital T. Agree? Capital T is a period, the time period, for one revolution. How many radians did I cover if I went around the circle one time? Two pi. Two pi. So you see omega is any arbitrary angle over the time it took to develop that angle. And in particular, omega is always one complete revolution over the time it takes to make one complete revolution. So omega is always 2 pi over t. So we can equate these two. We can say omega equals omega. Does anybody have any trouble with that? No. That means that 2 pi over capital T is equal to theta over small t. Making this substitution and that substitution. This is omega, 2 pi over capital T. This is omega, small theta. They're proportional. Small theta over small t. Is that okay, Jen? Yeah, I thought you said um, omega is 2 pi over pi. Is that what you 2 pi over? Over the period? 2 pi the over the period of one revolution. Period. Oh, okay. 2 pi over the period of one revolution. Got it. Sorry. Now, if I multiply both sides of this equation by t, what I'm going to get is that 2 pi over capital T times small t equals theta. Two pi over capital T times small t equals theta. Now, in this sine function, I've measured the sine by measuring the central angle, agree? But if the central angle is created by somebody running around, then I could also measure the central angle by how long he's been running. For example, if he's been running for one-fourth of a period, I argue that the central angle is pi over 2. If he's been running for half of a period, I argue that the central angle is um, half of a period. And if he's been running for a whole period, I argue that the central pi is 2 pi. So that means that the central angle, the angle that is at the center, is proportional to the time he's been running. So that means that we can rewrite the sine of theta as the sine of what theta is equal to, which is 2 pi over capital T times small t. So we can measure the growth of theta, not as a growth of an angle, but as a passing of time, as long as we're dealing with circular motion. And this is equal to the sine of omega t. That means that instead of using an axis that measured an angle, I could have used an axis that measured time. Now, at this point, the angle is 2 pi. How much time has gone by? How long does it take to run around the circle once? Can you say 20 minutes? Yeah, as a special example, but in general, it's 1t, is it not? No. So how long does it take to run halfway around the circle? t over 2. So you see that you can create a parallel system of units to measure the horizontal axis 
on the sine function. You can use time uh, instead of theta as long as you are dealing with circular motion. So that means that we have these two new functions. We have the sine of omega t versus t. And we're going to measure it in units of capital T, two capital T, capital T over two. And lo and behold, it's going to be the same sine function. So this is our sine fun function where we track it as a function of time instead of a function of angle. Can we also do the same with the cosine function? This is one revolution, it's capital T, and this is the cosine of omega t. back to our circle. I'm going to put a coordinate system at the center of the circle. And I'm going to have something going in motion around the circle. And it's always going to create, create a central angle theta. At this point, it's going to have coordinates. If the radius of the circle is r, it's going to have r cosine theta, and it's going to have r sine theta. But since theta is equal to omega t, then these can be written as r sine omega t, r cosine omega t, and r sine omega t. what happens to the x-coordinate as time goes by. First, when the angle is zero, when it's just starting out, what does x equal? Yeah. x equals r, agree? R. Yes. x is the full amount of r. Okay. So this is a t equals zero. So at t equals pi over two, then what is the value of x at this location? x equals zero. At t equals pi, what is the value of x at this location? Uh, it's equal to minus r, right? And at t equals three pi over two, down here, then x comes back to being zero. And at t equals, um, uh, here I'm measuring these as angles, and I should be measuring them as amounts of periods. At time equals zero, it's at r. At time equals the period over four, it's at zero. At time equals the period over two, it's at minus r. At equal to three periods, three fours, and at time goes back to one period, it comes back to zero. So you can measure the x position, and we have a function that will measure that position. It is x equals r cosine omega t. And all you have to do is put in the values for t, and it will tell you the x position at any point on the trip. Now how about the y position? The y position is going to be given by r sine omega t. So you're now describing circular motion in terms of the radius of the circle and the amount of time that goes by. Now, I have to share with you something that you might not have known. First, I want you to take another look at this equation. x equals car, 
cosine omega t, agree? Yes. Now, what I want to do is track what's happening to the x. The x starts out right here, doesn't it? Yes. And as time goes by, x goes to zero, doesn't it? x goes up to zero? Oh. As more time goes by, x goes to minus r, doesn't it? Then it turns around and starts coming back again, doesn't it? So the x-coordinate goes back and forth like this, doesn't it? The x-coordinate goes back and forth like that. It oscillates, doesn't it? So this is describing oscillatory motion. The x-coordinate is oscillating between plus r and minus r. It's going back and forth. It's oscillating. What else do you know that oscillates? Please tell me what I've drawn there. It's a spring. Yes. It's a spring, okay? Now, what happens if you stretch the spring and let go of it? It oscillates, agree? If, if you stretch the spring and let go of it, then it bounces back and forth. And therefore, since it's oscillating, you would think that maybe it can be described by this equation that describes x oscillating because the, the spring is doing exactly the same thing. Now, springs are different. The first thing about a spring is that it has a relaxed length. If nobody's pushing on it, this is just the length it likes to be. And you can do two things with a spring. You can pull it out, or you can compress it. Now, notice what happens. This is the relaxed length. This is where it likes to be. Now, if you try to pull the spring out longer than that, so that you have moved it out a distance d from its relaxed length, then you notice what happens is, when you first start to pull on it, it's pretty easy. But the longer you pull on it, the harder it gets to stretch it any further, agree? So the amount of extension that you make on it, d, uh, creates a stronger force pulling you back. So if I call f the force that is pulling your hand back by the spring, then the force is proportional to d, the extension of it. And if you're pulling it in this direction, the force is pulling in the opposite direction, trying to pull you back. So the force is proportional to minus d. Now, we don't know the constant of proportionality, so for the moment, we'll just call it k. But that means if you stretch it twice as far, it will create twice the force. If you stretch it three times as far, it will create three times the force. So the amount of force you create is proportional to the amount of stretching. Now the other thing you can do with a spring is you can compress it. So you compress it here. This is the length it likes to be. So you compress it by a distance d. Now, as you compress the spring, does it get harder to compress the more you compress it? Its resistance increases, agree? So once again, the force is equal to some constant times the amount of compression that you try to put on it. At first, it's easy to compress, but then later, it gets very hard to compress. And if you're compressing it in this direction, then the force is against what you're trying to do. So it's a minus sign in the reverse direction. So the more you try to compress the spring or extend the spring, the stronger force of resistance you create on the spring. On the spring. Now, the University of Maryland has given me a very generous demonstration equipment budget. And I've used most of it to buy tonight's demonstration <laughs> equipment. Wow. There's a little bit left yet. <laughs> now, this is a spring. As I try to stretch it, it gets harder yeah. each time, right? I can't even stretch it any more than that. Now, this is only really half a spring because the real spring will also compress. This one doesn't much compress. It but it will stretch pretty good, mm -hmm. agree? Mm -hmm. So now, uh, this is our example of a half a spring, one that will actually um, uh, stretch. And the more you stretch it, the more it resists being further stretched. This is like borrowing money from a friend. When you first borrow a little bit of money from the friend, there's no resistance at all, agree? 
Then you come back the next day, borrow some more, you borrow some more the next week, and the more you borrow, the more the resistance to any increased borrowing rate. So the stretching and compression for spring is like borrowing money from a friend. Now, springs come in different stiffness. You have seen some big springs, big strong springs, that look like this. And then you've seen some thin springs that look like this. Now, do you think there would be a difference in the difficulty of compressing one of these springs or the other? Different springs have different amounts of resistance to compression. It's called the stiffness of the spring. That means, in terms of our formula, the K for a stiff spring has K big. But for a small spring, K is small. It means it doesn't take much force to get a big distance. So now I'm going to test you. Here I have two springs. I have this one, and then I have this one. Which has the higher K? The first one or the second one? Which has the most resistance to being stretched? This, so you see, springs come with their own K. The K is determined by the material and the thickness of the material and the design. So the K is a property of the spring. Now, if you want to measure the K for a particular spring, you can do it as follows. First, if you stretch something with a spring, then it will create a force. Now here I have a mass. It is a mass, agree? Agreed. Now, if I drop this mass like all of it, it's going to fall. Why is it falling? Because gravity is pulling on it with a certain force. Now the amount of mass in this object is not its weight. The amount of mass in this object is the amount of material in the object. So if I took this object to the moon, would it still have the same amount of material? Yes. yes. So the mass doesn't change. But when the mass is in a gravitational field, then the gravity pulls on the mass, giving it weight. So if you have an object of mass m, gravity is pulling down with a force that goes up with a more mass, and it has a value that is the strength of the gravitational field. And the product of those two creates the weight of the object. So if you went to the moon, would the gravitational field on the moon have a smaller g than the gravitational field on the Earth? Yes. And therefore, your weight would be less, but your mass would be the same, agreed? Mm -hmm. So we know that this mass is being pulled down with a force equal to its weight. Now, this right here, I'm going to tell you, has a weight of equal to 1.6 pounds. Now, if I put it on the table, it doesn't fall. Why doesn't it fall? Because the table is pushing up with a force 1.6 pounds. Now, if I um, do this to it, notice it also doesn't fall, does it? Because it has a force going down equal to its weight, agree? Which is equal to 1.6 pounds. But there must be some balancing force pulling up, or else it would fall, agree? Where is the balancing force coming from? From the spring, agree? So we have the spring pulling up with a force that is equal to 1.6 pounds. Therefore, there's a balance of forces, and the object doesn't move. Now, this spring has been extended. This is its new length, agree? Mm -hmm. So this length here is exactly 6 inches. This is the relaxed length of the spring 
um, which is exactly um, two inches. So here I have a spring, and the relaxed length is two inches. But now I stretch the spring out, so it has a new length of six inches. So I created a displacement D of four inches, agree? Four inches, I've extended it. So D measures the amount of extension from its relaxed length. Now we know that the force is equal to KD because that means it's a spring and that means the more you displace it, the higher force that you create. We know D because it's equal to four. Now at an extension of four, then what is the amount of force that the spring is generated is equal to the amount of force of gravity pulling down, agree? So how much force have I generated in the spring in this situation? What's the weight of the stake foot? So I've generated 1.6 of force, agree? So when, by doing this simple experiment, I've just been able to determine the K of any spring. All you do is hang a known weight from it and see how much it extends. And this gives you a way to measure the K of any spring. So this tells me that K is equal to 0 0.4 for this spring. So this is how you measure the K for any um, spring. Okay, so if the force, I mean, if the, the weight is dangling, then the force and the weight are equivalent? If the force is... I'm sorry, if the weight, if the object is dangling, then the force and the weight Yes, because if they were not equivalent, it would not dangle. Yeah. It would go in the direction of the greater force. So it only in that situation, though, not if it was... That's right. Okay. That's right. It's called equilibrium. Yeah. So you establish an equilibrium and measure the parameters and put them into the equation, and that gives you the variable that you're looking for. So this is how we measure K for a spring. So let's go to page 887. 887. Example 11.13. I'll read the words. Um, Randy, I'll read the words to you. <laughs> Suppose an object weighing 64 pounds stretches a spring 8 feet. So here we have a 64 pound object, and it takes a spring, and the spring has been stretched eight feet. In order to support the object, the spring got stretched eight feet. So first, what is K for this spring? That's right, 64 equals K8. Therefore, K also equals 8. Okay. Solution. To find K, we use Hooke's Law. I guess you didn't know this. This is known as Hooke's Law. And? So should our answer be positive negative? And it's, Hooke's Law is named after the hook. <laughs> yes, the answer before should have been K. No, K is the positive number. No, no, no. Oh because the displacement was also negative. Oh. It went down four. So I should have said D was minus four or something like that. Because oh. the direction of the displacement, um, well, no, it's not. The displacement is positive, but the force goes upwards, so the force is a minus. So the minus signs cancel out. Oh, okay. K is always a positive number. Okay. K is always a positive number. <laughs> Okay, now uh, we are, we will get our coordinate system straight, and it's not the one that you would expect. Down is plus, and up is minus. In this coordinate system, the author chose it, not myself, but the reason that he's calling down plus is because that's the direction gravity pulls. So he's defining that to be plus, and you can define it any way it wants. Make it more gravity. Um, yeah, he prefers to give a bias to its gravity. So um, in this situation, um, you see that the force 
of the spring is pulling up, agree? Mm -hmm. So the force would have a minus sign in it. But the displacement is going down, so the displacement would be plus. So you have a minus sign on each side, k turns out to be plus. And I'm wondering, so in this situation, k tells you, I guess, what exactly? k tells the you the stiffness of the spring. The stiffness of Whether the you spring. have a strong spring or a weak spring, k measures the strength of the spring. So now you know the k for the spring. And that's not going to change. No matter what you hang from it, a small weight or a big weight, since it's a property of the spring and the spring hasn't changed, for whatever you do with that spring, that K belongs to that spring and will not change. So any problem you use that spring in will have that K that you've just determined. Uh, because the distance will change depending on the weight. The distance will change depending on the weight, but the strength of the spring is given by the spring. Okay? So K is a property of the spring. It does not change in any problem that uses that same spring. Uh, distances will change, forces will change, but the K will not change. Now, I, I have a certain strength. So I can lift 300 pounds this far. I can lift 200 pounds that far. So the distances are different and the weights are different, agree? But my strength doesn't change, so the spring doesn't change. K belongs to the spring. Now, um, let's get back to this oscillatory motion. Um, I could have bought the cheaper equipment, but I went for the good stuff. <laughs> now notice here, I'm generating oscillatory motion, agree? Mm -hmm. Just like that X chord in it that went up and down. This thing is oscillating, is it not? Now I'm going to call this direction the X direction, just to agree with the book. I'm going to call this direction the x direction, just to agree with the book. Now, what happens is, I'm going to make initial displacement. I'm going to pull it down and hold it. Now, I have extended it an initial amount. So the amount of initial extension, I'm going to call x0. extended at a certain amount, you know as soon as I let go of it, if it was a real spring, it would pull it back up, right? Mm -hmm. It would compress. So when you extend it and let go of it, then the spring automatically starts the oscillatory motion. It pulls it back towards the middle, but because of inertia, when it reaches the middle, it doesn't stop. It keeps going the other way, and now you're trying to compress the spring, which also is hard to do. So you come to a grinding halt. Now the spring is compressed, so it pushes back out. And that means it picks up speed again. And as it goes through the zero point, it has maximum speed. So let's test the, let's draw the cycle on the board. This is the zero length of the spring. And let's put a mass right there. Now first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the mass out to a starting distance of x0. Now I'm going to let go of it. What's going to happen when I let go of it? It's going to be pulled to the left, agree? Now, as it gains speed, when it gets back to its initial position, it's moving quickly, is it not? And has energy. So it's not going to stop, it's going to now compress the spring. So it compresses the spring the same distance because it has the same energy. So now the spring is compressed an amount x0. Now what does the spring do? It pushes back, agreed? So when it pushes back, it comes to this position, but it's moving so it doesn't stop. It keeps on going and stretches the spring this way, compresses the spring and stretches the spring, agreed? So you have oscillatory motion, so x is equal to x0 cosine omega t. It's oscillatory motion. I'm just wondering, you said x0 is the initial extension. Right. 
Wouldn't it be the first part, or? Uh, first, x equals 0. x equals 0. Mm -hmm. x equals x0. This is the neutral position. So with my hand, I pull it out. Okay, so from the point of neutral position to the new point? Is, is, is x0. Okay. That's right. Now, let's go to these initial curves that we have. If this is the sine function, and this is the cosine function, when the cosine is maximum, what's the sine? Zero. When the sine is maximum, what's the cosine? Uh, zero. Right, so they switch, don't they? Yeah. So now look at this. When x is zero, in this position right here, um, after we get this thing moving, um, when it comes out to the end point here, x is in its maximum position, is it not? Mm -hmm. But as it comes to its end point and changes direction, its velocity is zero, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It comes to a stop, changes direction. So at this point, it's not moving, is it? Right. So x is maximum and v is zero, agreed? Now it starts coming flying back. At what point in its path does it have maximum velocity? When it goes through the zero point, agreed? In the middle, yeah. In the middle. In the middle, x is zero, is it not? And v is maximum. x is zero in the middle. Yes, yes. And v is maximum. Now we come to the other side. At the other side, x equals minus x zero. And what is v at this position? As it reverses direction, what is v? Is it moving? When it comes here and stops and goes back, what's its velocity right there? It has to be zero, right? Yeah. It has to stop before it reverses direction. So it's velocity x, v is zero. So here, v is max, x equals zero. Here, x equals max and v equals zero. So if x is a cosine function, what is the function that reverses maxes and mins? Then what must v be if x is a cosine function? So let's look at it this way. When x is a maximum out to here, what is v? Zero. Zero, agree? Good. Now, when v is a maximum right here, what's x? Oh. Zero. Agree? Now we come here. x is minus a maximum. x is minus a maximum down here. Then what is v? Zero. Zero. So you see that V V equals V zero sine omega T. V equals sine sine omega T because X equals cosine. One is maximum when the other is minimum, one is minimum when the other is maximum. And these are the two equations of harmonic motion. <laughs> And let's illustrate that with our pricey equipment. Notice, here I have maximum extension at zero speed, agreed? Now I go through the middle, and it's, it's maximum speed in the middle. When it comes to the top, it stops again, right? Now I'm going to show you another example. This is called harmonic motion because it's back and forth. Now I'm going to show you another example of harmonic motion. And I'd like you to know that this equipment came out of my own pocket. Didn't even use Marilyn's budget. Notice I have an initial displacement over here, agreed? Now, what's the velocity at this point? Zero. Zero. But it has. Now, what I want to do is talk about this central angle. I 
want to talk about this angle theta. So right here, theta equals zero. I'm going to define zero to be at the bottom. This is my zero angle, okay? Out here, I have my initial angle, theta zero. Now I'm going to let this thing go. Now when it reaches the two extreme points, is it moving? Right there, it's not. It has to go to zero to change direction, agreed? So at the two zero points, at the two points of change, the extreme points, it has zero velocity, but maximum angle, true? Now let's look at the low point. The angle is zero, true? But isn't the low point where the velocity is highest? Yeah. Right, so this is also harmonic motion. A simple pendulum is harmonic motion also, as well as a spring. So everyday examples. Um, now, I'm going to pull some stuff out of my armpit. Because um, you guys don't yet know calculus, some of you. So therefore, I'm going to give you some calculus results. Okay? Um, we have that if you have a certain spring and you create harmonic motion, the harmonic motion has a certain period. And that period defines an omega. Indeed, does this pendulum not have a certain period, amount of time to come back to the same place? So its period divided into 2 pi defines the omega for this system. So this system has an omega. This object also has a mass, does it not? Good. So now we understand omega and mass. Now, if it was a spring, then would it not also have a K? The stiffness in the spring. So we have the three parameters. We have omega, which is the inverse period. We have K, which is the stiffness of the spring. And we have the mass. Now, these three objects are related in that omega is equal to the square root of k over m. And you will just have to accept that here as a result of a higher calculation. Omega is equal to the square root of m. Okay? Uh, we generally think of it as omega squared equals k over m, which is the equivalent equation. And you can think of it either way that you want. And the situation K is still the strength. K is the strength. Okay. Now, that means that this rubber band right here, if I hang this mass from it, if I hang this mass from it, um, If I hang this mass from it, Ted, we have to talk about that budget. <laughs> Tim, do better for me. Now, this is a system of a spring and a mass. Does this system not already have its frequency of oscillation determined? Because isn't omega square root of k over m? I know k, I know m. So before I even start the system, I know what frequency it's going to oscillate at. It's built into the system. It's called the natural frequency of that system. So this system has a natural frequency of oscillation, and we call it omega, uh, which is another way to define t, if you want. And the only thing I can change is I can change the beginning x0, which is called the amplitude, the initial value. Now, this is a little bit easier when we use the pendulum. Because I want you to notice this astounding fact, which is true. This is my pendulum. It's also a simple harmonic motion. Now, this initial displacement is what we call also the amplitude, with the initial displacement. Now, I'm going to let this... Now, this system has a certain 
mass right here. It also has a certain quantity of K. In this case, the K is determined by gravity. So it also comes with a system. Because the spring that's pulling this is gravity, is it not? So this is a K of gravity. So this system is completely defined. Now, I want to give you the oscillations when I start out here. And watch what happens. Now, I want to start with a much smaller amplitude. Now watch what happens here. Now I'm going to start with a big amplitude. Now watch what happens. You will notice that no matter what amplitude I start with, the frequency or period is the same. Because the period is not determined by the amplitude, the period is determined by the spring and by the mass, which don't change if you start out here or change in here. So all pendulums swing with the same period. Doesn't this tell you why grandfather clocks are different sizes? Whether you have a big grandfather clock with a tick-tock this big, or a little one with a tick-tock this big, the period of oscillation is the same. So they can keep time. If that wasn't true, you wouldn't have grandfather clocks. So that's a direct result of this. So what we're going to do now is take our 10 minute break, and when we come back, I'm going to wind up this presentation and then turn the whiteboards over to you. So, break time. I wonder what Suami was waiting for. The whiteboards or the break? Uh, she had trouble. Um, oh, we'll connect that. Showing that example now. Oh, did you look at 11.1 on your own? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. oh, yeah, well, we'll get to that. I just wanted to do the new material first, okay. which just has nothing to do with what we're going to do next. back a big coffee too. And I will take the uh, tofu caramel. Tofu? Yeah, the caramel. Oh, the caramel. The caramel, yeah. Yeah, I would. With no sugar, no milk, just straight caramel, nothing else. One button. One button. Yeah. Okay, I think I know that. Okay. This morning. Good. Okay. Take your time. Yeah. And have a soup if you want. You want a soup? No, I'll wait until... Okay, all right. Okay, now, what I did upstairs was I put a soup and a sandwich out of the freezer for me. So if you want one too, maybe you want to go up a little early and uh, do the microwave on them. Okay. Just yours you put outside? I just put mine out. didn't know what you would want for yourself. Okay. So you can pull out whatever you want as well. Okay, got it. Mine are out by the microwave. I'll go out early. Hi. Later. Got it. Did you want me to microwave yours too? Just a touch because it's almost all gone. Okay, got it.
I just didn't have a chance to look. Oh, okay. yeah, I looked around noon, but not later. Okay. That's sad. She so. said she ate something funny for lunch. Um, oh, just food mostly? Yeah, and she said she ate some curry. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so one or two days. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. There's no class tomorrow. Let's mm -hmm. get out. My best to her. Did she mention where she bought the curry? No, actually. Maybe she made it herself. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, insidious. No fun. Yeah. Where do you work? Oh, really? Mm -hmm. At the it's where? At the where? At the pet shop on 23. What a yeah. great job. It's on 23? Yeah, at Pets Park. He's got to get two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, it's a new thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great job. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you get equipment budget. <laughs> yeah. 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 You want everybody who goes through here to not learn math. <laughs> well, maybe you want your animals to not have a good tomorrow. <laughs> I tell you, I guess you have to learn what they need and what to do for them and all of that. Do you work at a desk or in the bathroom? Oh, Hobby Lobby is just a pet shop, so all I do oh, is like take, take care of selling them, mm -hmm. clean, you know, clean up after them, mm -hmm. give them baths, make sure they get their exercise, and if they get sick, take them to the vet. Which is their vet, but yeah, <laughs> our first floor. Do you ever come in in the morning and some of them are missing and the others look well fed? Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Spanish? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit, though. Mm -hmm. They know. Hola, me llamo Jennifer. Mm -hmm. My name is Jennifer. Mayama. <laughs> Mayama. Mayama? Yeah, I think it takes gender. Oh, yes. Mayama is Mayama. Mayama should be. But I may be wrong on that. This is from Most of us take gender. I don't even remember. Well, it's a verb. Mayama. Well, not verb, but a uh, My name is. Almost all stood. Might be that is that is that just hello or is that like the beauty? That's um como how está? Are how are you? Oh you are how? Yeah, I learned formal Spanish, Castilian, which everybody sneers at. You're what? Formal Spanish. High yeah, that's Spanish. What I learned too. Oh, high Spanish. Spanish, yeah. Like from Spain. Yeah, nobody nobody uses it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh really? I it is street Spanish. 
low, lower Spanish. Yeah. So we, no. It's, it's like, like the way you speak like, Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's not the way you hear it. Like, I know. Local, so That's like, what I hated. They like that you try, but they're kind of like, hey, yeah, right. that's not how you say it. <laughs> okay. We're the same way. Yeah. We're the same yeah, way. Yeah, it sounds to be soft one way, too, or something, but you're yeah. just kind of like, I mean, that's cool, but you know you say it like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> I know, the, the best thing for me, like, I have a hard time learning Japanese in classes, but just being, like, immersed is so much easier. Like, when you're with somebody who cannot speak English, I think it's the best way to learn. When you are forced to. Do you have an ear? I can't pick it up by ear. Um, I'm the opposite. I can't learn anything by conversation. Yeah, I have to do conversation. I, I can't do ear. like memorizing the meanings of kanji or vocabulary. I have to pick it out and hear it. Though. Sounds like a lot more fun than my method. <laughs> yeah, I should study it. Like, I mean, I'll pick up on things, but it's a lot faster for me to get there. Okay. Um, I think I mentioned there's a little bit more presentation to make about this simple harmonic motion. Um, the first is, why is it called harmonic motion? Is because this thing moves with a certain frequency. And if you know about musical notes, each musical note has its own pure frequency, the number of times per second it vibrates. For example, a perfect A I think vibrates uh, 440 times a second is the vibration. And so if, and that's called harmony. Uh, when you reproduce that frequency, you're in harmony with it. So since this essential element of this is the natural frequency with which it oscillates and it's determined by the system, it's called a harmonic system. It has its own frequency. And uh, that's why the name occurs. And now we've derived the equations for them, the sinusoidal equations or cosines. Uh, it's the same. And we have pulled out of the blue the fact that omega, which is the natural frequency of oscillation, this system has a natural frequency of oscillation omega. And it's given by the K of the system divided by the mass that is being oscillated. And then we have also talked about this maximum extension where we start. We call it the amplitude in Greek, and I called it x0, because x0 is the extension uh, that you make in the direction of motion, and when you make this maximum extension and let go of it, then that defines the amplitude, and it will not change. It'll go back and forth with that amplitude. Right? So instead of saying x equals x0, cosine omega t, I more correctly could say x equals the maximum amplitude, which is the maximum extension. Now, the amplitude, or the maximum extension, is not always the same as the original extension. And that is, if you give it a little kick, that you start it. So to illustrate what I'm doing. First, I'm going to have an initial extension, theta zero, okay? Now I'm gonna let go of it, and that theta zero becomes the amplitude, true? It always goes back to the same theta, I mean, same theta zero, agree? Mm -hmm. But if I start over here, but I don't just let go of it, but I give it a velocity in that direction, mm -hmm. an initial velocity, now the amplitude is greater than the initial displacement, because I gave it a kick in that direction. So the amplitude is a combination of the initial displacement and any initial velocity you give it. And that combination is that the amplitude is determined by the square root of the initial displacement. Now, if the only thing you did was have an initial displacement, then you agree that A equals X zero. But if you do give it a speed, v0, then you increase the amplitude. And the increase in the amplitude is given by the term v0, the kick that you gave it, divided by omega, the natural frequency of the system. We also said that v 
is equal to its maximum velocity as it crosses the midpoint, sine omega t. So let's remind ourselves what V0 is. V0 is the maximum velocity, the velocity at the highest velocity point, which is at the center of the oscillation. That's V0. And um, um, well, actually, I'm using V0 in two different ways. Um, because here I use V0 for the kick, and here I'm using V0 for the maximum velocity. So I will go to a single notation, and I will call this V max. Now, V max is equal to A omega. So these are the formulas for simple harmonic motion. They're on the board. Most of them have just been given to you instead of derived, which is all we can do without the calculus. Uh, but these are the formulas that you use to solve a problem. So let's tackle a problem. Let's take this example. Um, page 887, example 11.13. So let's get my initial equations down. First we have Hooke's law, f equals minus kd. Uh, we have that k is equal, I mean omega equals the square root of k over m. And we have that um, the initial, the maximum amplitude a is given by the initial displacement plus the amount of kick that you gave it. And then we have the two equations of motion. That x is equal to a cosine omega t, and v, the velocity, is equal to a omega sine omega t. So these are our equations that describe simple harmonic motion. And all we have to do with any given problem is simply use them. So we have the understanding now. So now it's just a matter of calculation. Suppose an object weighing 64 pounds stretches a spring eight feet. So it weighs 64 pounds and it stretches a spring from its equilibrium length to eight feet. So Brandy already told us that that tells us that um, by Hooke's law, K equals minus F over D so k is also equal to 8. So we use that little piece of information to determine the stiffness of the spring. If the object is attached to a spring and released 3 feet below the equilibrium position, so we have a drawing. This is the initial equilibrium position. And then we stretch it down. And we stretch it down 3 feet, and we release it. Find the equation of motion of the object, x of t. Now, um, x is given by a cosine omega t. So we have to find a and we have to find omega. Now, omega is equal to the square root of k over m. So omega equals the square root of k over m. So that's the square root of 8 over m. because Brandy told us that k was 8. Now, what is m? Remember that the weight of an object, gravity pulling down, has a weight equal to mg. We're told that the weight of the object is 64, and we know that gravity is a universal constant equal to 32. never changes, telling you that m is equal to 2. So by knowing the relation between weight and mass in a gravitational field g, we can tell that this object has a mass of 2. And we can put that in to calculate that omega is 2. 
So we found omega. Now we need to find A. So this is the equation for A. A equals square root of x squared plus v zero squared over omega. Is there any initial kick, or did I just let go of the object? Just let go of it. So v zero is zero, so A is just the initial displacement. And how much was the initial displacement? Three. So that means x equals A, which is three, cosine of omega, which is two times t. And we found the equation of motion. Sorry, so x, what equation is that? Oh, this, this is it cosine? This okay. is this equation. Okay, got it. Well, we found A from the equations, and we found omega from the equations. And A? A so is given by this equation. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. And x0 is 3, and v0 is 0. It was not kicked. So we have found the equation of motion. Um, he does it in a more complicated fashion because he refuses to use cosine. He's all alone in that. Okay. Now question two, if an object is attached to the spring and released three feet but when does the object pass through, first pass through the equilibrium position? When does it first pass through the equilibrium position? I would suggest that it passes through the equilibrium position in one-fourth of a period. 